Welcome to Crescat to Crescat's live market call featuring our macro and activist mining research. I'm Kevin Smith, Crescat's founder and chief investment officer. Before we get started, please refer to our important disclosures page on the screen now. These can also be found in the description uh, on Crescat's YouTube channel uh, and on our website. Crescat's live market call is about sharing timely macro and newsworthy geologic updates including the positive and the negative news across our holdings as they arise. These videos represent the opinions of Crescat as a mining and exploration industry advocate. Our objective is to share the overall geologic progress on our activist strategy in creating new economic metal deposits in viable mining jurisdictions around the world. If you enjoy our videos, please click on the like button and make sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channel to get notified of upcoming episodes. You can also follow Crescat Capital on Twitter for ongoing macro research and important news updates on our activist metals positions. If you want to learn more about Crescat's investment strategies, we encourage you to reach out to Merrick. His contact information is on the screen now and can be found on our website at Crescat.net. So let's get started. I'm going to keep my presentation short today so we can uh, leave plenty of time for Tavi and, and Quentin, who's got some important news on our um, on our base metal positions. Today is going to be uh, a call about our activist metals position in the base metals mining um, segment. So uh, what are we looking at here? Um, I, I'm sure many of you know that gold has just broken out to a new all time high today. And, um, and the mining stocks are starting to perform. Um, but what you'll notice is that this chart here from Incrementum, from Roni Sturfley over at Incrementum, uh, is showing what happens when you reach the last Fed rate hike, which we think we've had here, what normally happens to gold mining stocks. This is using the HUI index. That's the gold bugs index. Uh, but look at what happens after the last Fed rate hike. Even as you're going into a recession, gold mining stocks on average tend to perform extremely well. And in, uh, in 102, we had 76 percent, um, you know, run up after that last Fed rate hike, 37 uh, percent in 2008. And then in, uh, in the 2020 uh, period there, we had a 91 percent run up. Um, and here we are. You know, I think the Fed is signaling. They've already signaled that it's their last hike for a while. And they may even be um, decreasing rates again here soon. Uh, so um, this is just another exciting setup for a mining, our mining positions. And um, let's go on to the next. Um, gold stock, um, gold stock funds had their largest inflow uh, in almost a year last week, a lot of people have been complaining how gold is moving up. But, uh, you know, for instance, the, um, you know, other other funds that that U.S. investors and global investors invest in, whether it's the GLD or 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 um, or gold mining funds, just haven't seen the inflows yet. It's mostly been central bank buying that's been driving gold prices higher. But maybe now we're starting to see those flows start to come back last week was the first significant week of inflows, the, the largest inflow into gold funds since May of 2023 in almost a year. So this is encouraging with gold breaking out to new all-time highs here. Let's go on to the next. So Quentin's going to be talking about base our base metal activist metals positions today. And this is a chart uh, we were looking at in our invest, investment meeting the other day. It comes um, courtesy of Robert Friedland, uh, and it's based on the S&P market intelligence data. Um, it's looking at, at major copper discoveries. And, you know, one of the, the big theses, theses that we have is that there has been an underinvestment in drilling and discovery. That's why we've been focused on getting money to the exploration companies to make discoveries and to do that drilling. Uh, and create the value that's associated with that. But but this macro imbalance of 
lack of new discoveries at a time when we have all this, this these fiscal spending programs, um, especially in the U.S. Uh, between the the Infrastructure Act and the Inflation Reduction Act and the Chips Act, we have a number of of programs, government spending programs that are that are bigger relative to GDP than Johnson's Great Society and, and the New Deal. Uh, and all the spending is still on the table yet to come. And we have def, you know, record deficits that we're going to going to incur in order to, to finance the, the government support of, of the of these spending programs. Um, but so there's a major supply and demand imbalance. We don't have the new discoveries of metal to meet the demand for all these infrastructure and and renewable energy projects that that we have look at the lack of copper discoveries over the last 10 years Quentin's going to be touching on this let's go on to the next um positioning we are still very much um we still very much believe that we have a major rotation coming a rotation out of overvalued long duration financial assets and into undervalued commodities and uh, in a rising inflationary, rising commodity price environment, there's opportunity on the long commodity equity investing side of things. And there's and investors are overweight, not just in equities and large cap growth equities and mega cap tech in particular, but also in bonds. Interest rates have come up. The Fed raised interest rates. We had a big bond market correction. Investors lost money in bonds significantly, uh, you know, in the last in the last year as interest rates have come up. But um, but what have they done? They've just bought more bonds. And the, the the issue with government debts and deficits is that somebody's got to buy that that. Somebody's got to buy those issuances, and it's become more attractive in a higher rate environment for investors, even though they've been burned by being long, long duration treasury bonds. They're, they're, they've come back for more. And so, investors at large, money managers, this is the BFA fund manager survey, are the most overweight in bonds relative to commodities. That they that they've been since the the bottom of the market in December of 2008, and look at uh, so you know this is part of our great rotation idea. It's why in our global macro fund we have short exposure to long duration government bonds. We have a yield curve steepening trade. We're long the two year yield, duration matched, and we're short the 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 30 year. Um, uh, but and we also believe that money will be rotating out of overvalued mega cap technology stocks and into undervalued commodities and commodity related stocks. This is just showing the positioning, how unbalanced it is. And we think this portends um, a lot of upside appreciation potential ahead um, because of the undervaluation of commodities relative to the overvaluation of bonds. Uh, let's look at the next chart. This is my last one. Um, I just wanted to reiterate this chart. We showed this about a month ago, um, but this is looking at, at just showing in another way that we have record valuations for large cap growth stocks, large cap S&P 500 companies, valuations that are at historic highs that match other markets like 1929 and like the tech bubble higher than the tech bubble valuations in terms of market cap concentration among the top decile of stocks the top 10 percent stocks this data comes from deutsche bank and it and it's showing that same kind of market cap concentration and overvaluation uh, we've shown the overvaluation in, in many ways. This is showing the concentration that goes along with that overvaluation at major critical market moments. And we, we think we're at one of those today. We believe we have a great rotation coming out of large cap equities, overvalued mega cap growth stocks in particular, and mega cap tech 
especially, and into undervalued commodities and commodity stocks. In our global macro and our long short funds, we're positioned to profit from both sides of that rotation out of overvalued large cap equities and into undervalued commodities. We're long undervalued commodity equities through this activist metals portfolio that, that we've created with Quentin. We also uh, have other commodity exposures on the equity side in oil and gas. And, um, and we have a biotech, a small biotech portfolio too, where we have a, an expert similar to Quentin, PhD uh, industry expert on the biotech side, who's been helping us pick the early stage biotech companies that were so beat up in the last couple of years that many of them were trading below their cash in the bank. Um, but our largest long exposure across the firm is on our activist metals portfolio. And, and the opportunity on the short side, however, um, is also there as we believe money is going to rotate out of overvalued long duration assets uh, in our global macro fund, we're expressing that through a yield curve steepening trade in addition to our shorts and overvalued mega cap equities. Um, and in our long short fund, we're more focused on the equity side of that trade. We don't have the yield curve steepener. Um, we believe so much of this trade is ripe to play out. For those interested in just the long only activist metals side, we have the precious metals fund. Um, and that, like I said, that is also the largest long sleeve of our other two funds. I think it's one of the most opportunistic times to be investing in this great rotation idea. There's so much ready to unfold. There's so much deep value on the on the long side of the of the undervalued commodity markets that are getting ready to break out under rising inflation and the Fed that's ready to start lowering interest rates again here pretty soon, but inflation is not going away. Inflation is sticky. Um, so if you're interested in our strategy, I really encourage you to reach out to America and learn more. I just think it's a great time to be putting money to work with gold breaking out. With stocks like Apple starting to roll over, they're not even talking about the MAG-7 anymore. It's the MAG-5, right? Because Apple has rolled over. Tesla is, is down substantially. I mean, these, so, look, the time is is here. I really believe it's time to to uh, take a serious look at Crestcat strategies. We've had a pullback, but now we're starting to get uh, we're starting to see positive performance come back. Inflows coming into the mining sector. Uh, it's it's just a very exciting time. We think to be putting money to work. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to Tavi, and we'll get on with the show. All right. Well, thanks, Kevin. Well, it looks we like you have one, one more chart. We no? can skip that one. Yeah. It's all right. Well, no problem. Okay. So, well, let's start with, uh, you know, I think it's the most important uh, thing going on today. And, and not only today, but really across the last few days this week. And it's, you know, we've been, uh, um, it's a strange world to to think that we're, we've been uh, having to convince people about the thesis to invest in gold and silver and 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 so forth and hard assets, but uh, if if there was ever an environment, in my opinion, that those types of uh, of investments would work, this to me is uh, is a, a very uh, uh, seems like a very opportunistic time to be invested in hard assets. And uh, what's happening today that is so important is is the quarterly close. This today is the last day of the quarter, and gold is is actually about to close at all-time highs not only all-time highs but breaking out and you know if you look at this chart and you compare the moment today with the early 2000s which i think is you know, I, I can argue that is is very comparable from a tech bubble perspective you have the early stages of a commodity markets you have this revamp of manufacturing and infrastructure developments happening with china and today we have the g7 economies uh, I would even go deeper and say, well, we didn't have inflation back in the early 2000s. Today, we do have inflation. Uh, we have a much more indebted economy relative to the early 2000s. Anyways, but just look at the the length of the cycle that we saw back in the early 2000s for gold market, uh, but also uh, the number of, of uh, candles on the quarterly basis that we had 
of, of green candles, and you can count on your own. Um, in my opinion, we are entering a, um, a a bull cycle for for precious metals overall. And if this is indeed the case that we're now confirming this uh, or validating this uh, thesis uh, as we speak, um, then there are a few things in the markets today that I, I think are offering incredible opportunities. Let's go to the next chart because we often talk about the two waves or three waves of inflation. But how about the second wave? Well, we're uh, of second wave of free cash flow that the miners are seeing uh, in the last you know, call it two quarters or so. This is a very recent, the data came in and I, you know, I like to look at the data when the miners report their numbers and I, I have different models that I like to look at. I look at the top 10 companies, the top 20, the top 30, the top 50. Um, and I try to see if there are different um, types of, uh, of trends happening across those, those companies, if it's just the major companies. And you can see in different ways, but uh, basically, Prices are really cheap, essentially. Prices have come down substantially in most of the miners. The fundamentals are improving. You know, the whole story that the cost structure of the miners is very challenging and so forth. It is, and it will always be the case. But the fact that gold prices and other metal prices have been rising, it's making it more and more economical. And so the fundamentals have been improving drastically. And so we're seeing underlying metal prices actually breaking out. And gold is the chart that I had in the prior slide and and you can see the same happening with copper and silver and zinc and so forth and the market sentiment remains you know excuse my language but in the toilet <laughs> and so it is it is perplexing to see that because you know in my view uh as i said before uh, when you have gold breaking out and the gld uh kevin had a, a funds uh or aum or assets money other management actually increasing in, in gld but not to the same degree that we've seen the price run up in, in gold, which proves, uh, and, and logically speaking, that potentially who's buying gold is central banks. And central banks don't buy the miners, and therefore the miners have not received the inflows yet. Uh, but I do think that that's going to change because as we as, as market participants start seeing the, the potential for asymmetry, uh, as gold prices continue to run up and 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 potentially even enter a a bull market and long term bull market, which is usually a secular move, um, then the miners are completely uncrowded and then can actually uh, see very significant re ratings and you know that window of opportunity. I used to say you know six months or so, it's closing up very quickly. Let's go to the next chart. Here's another one about valuations that are interesting because prices came down so much and the fundamentals are improving. You're starting to see some really interesting fundamental multiples showing or proving that the miners are really cheap. And this is not, you no, know, you don't need to have a view on gold. You don't need to have a view on commodities or it's just a view of, of, of value investing and just, you know, calculating how historically these companies are really cheap. And the median price to book in this case it resembles the period of the 2015 period when uh, those uh, the miners were really cheap as well. And we saw a run up. It was sort of a short run up in prices uh, of the miners. If you ask me, I think what we're going to see here is a much more long standing uh, trend uh, towards precious metals. I, I can't think of, uh, you know, I was in, you know, in, in this conference in, uh, in, in Switzerland. I've, I've, you know, we went to uh, PDAC in, in Toronto with, we talk to investors all the time. I cannot, and please correct me if I'm wrong, anybody here, but I cannot recall any other industry that is more hated than the gold miners. And, and maybe not uranium, maybe not silver miners, but gold miners is specifically as, as, as hated as they could be. And so, you know, in, in this industry of money management, uh, usually uh, skepticism tends to morph into opportunity. Not only that, but uh, when you have this, this level of, of neglection towards a, a certain industry or um, or level of, 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 of people just ignoring a, a segment of the market for so long, um, it creates very large inefficiencies. And, you know, those inefficiencies in a mining space are, are across many different ways. I mean, it's not just a capital, a lack of capital issue. I mean, Quentin can talk uh, extensively about the, the fact that we, we have shortage of geologists. And so, the more you go to the left side of this industry where exploration requires more knowledge about geology, it would probably be the most inefficient part of the industry because 
there's just a lack of people looking at those those assets and so um you know so we see companies putting out incredible results in our opinion uh and so intrinsically we see companies actually improving the probability of their um of of or the potential of, of finding reserves and at the same time the price of those securities uh, is not aligned with those probabilities increasing and so that's what we call inefficiency um but inefficiency is also another word for opportunity and and I view this as a, as, a, as a major opportunity for positioning in the portfolio. Let's go to the next chart. Not just me, but everyone here. Uh, Quinton asked me the other day, um, hey, Tavi, I know you look at all these ratios. Have you looked at the new mon to gold ratio? And I said, well, I can do that in a minute. And so I did it. And then I was, I was shocked. I was like, man, how is new mon trading at the same levels it was trading at 2015? And that's actually the lowest level in history or one of the lowest levels in history, if you want to be more specific. Um, but really forming potentially a double bottom if, in this chart. Uh, and I'm not very technical, but I think the much more compelling thesis here is the valuation, uh, is the, 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 the potential for gold turning. It's hard to believe that gold would enter a secular bull market and you wouldn't participate in it. But, you know, that's just my two cents. But uh, um, and by the way, this is not to pick on one specific company. Um, I think there's many other there are many other examples of companies that are uh, trading a very, very low multiples today in the, in the gold space. And this is just one ratio, given the fact that Newmont is 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 a leading uh, company in this industry. Let's go to the next chart. Um, and so recently we've had a now we've seen this trend happening by the way and i think uh the kevin had a chart from roni uh and and they actually had a really good report on in gold we trust which they do every year but the one of the i think was the last one was specifically about how uh, uh the accumulation of gold has been happening in eastern societies and if you haven't had the chance you should read it because it's really interesting they got many charts kind of proving that thesis Nonetheless, this chart is kind of doing exactly the same, and it's basically looking at the Chinese gold imports um, and uh, or basically Swiss gold exports to mainland China and Hong Kong. So you're seeing the surge of of gold imports uh, in China and Hong Kong. It's really interesting. Um, it, it certainly is is kind of a, a sort of validating that idea that that what's driving gold prices is, is central banks uh, purchases. I know this is not central bank specifically, although, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if the PBOC is not the one behind this buying gold. Um, but let's go to the next chart. And so interestingly, when, you know, I look at that chart, it comes to my mind, this chart that we had it in the letter. It's the main chart in the letter, which shows foreign central banks transitioning towards gold. The idea of this chart is just to show you how in the uh, blue bars is, is the percentage of gold allocation relative to international reserves has been increasing and how the government in the U.S. is specifically, but you can extrapolate this to other economies too, Germany and France and Italy and uh, and Australia and so forth. And what you're seeing is this massive issuances, a flood of issuances of, of government securities. In other words, those countries are essentially broken financially. So they're issuing a bunch of debt. But the problem is that the, there are no major buyers. And so that's the blue, the white line you're seeing. So uh, essentially central banks are participating less and less of the treasury market in this case, in the U.S. treasury market. And so foreign central banks are transitioning away from uh, from owning a large percentage of treasuries into gold slowly but surely. And that's just what the idea of the chart really is. Let's go to the next chart. And so um, here is one thing that comes to my mind when I think about gold breaking out and making this quarterly breakout that I was showing in the very first chart. And it comes to my mind is silver, right? And then, and and you know, thinking about other roadmaps that we've had in the past, this chart is just such a critical chart because uh, silver today in the end is actually retesting the highs of 2011. Think about that for a second. I mean, 2011 was a period when silver had a big explosive move to the upside, and you know, today we're retesting those levels now, and and not many people are talking about this and. What is likely to happen is that the white line, which is silver in U.S. dollar terms, is probably going to fall on the same line. I remember looking at a very similar chart of gold in yen terms not too long ago when people were saying that triple tops work. Remember that? Well, triple tops, I guess, did not work. 
and gold actually follow the pattern of the Japanese yen. And so I think this is a roadmap. And so I, I'm paying very close attention to this chart because I think we're very close to a explosive move in silver uh, to follow or catch up with the blue line in this chart. Let's go to the next chart. And so uh, here is one reason why I think a lot of um, commodities are going to enter a bull market. I can come up with many other, but here's a very important one. When you have this uh, deglobalization trends globally, I guess so deglobalization globally is, is, is a little bit uh, uh, too much of the word global, but um, deglobalization is a real factor in terms of the inflationary trends that we're seeing. And what creates is is a need for economies to really reshore and and really refocus uh towards their domestic operations and change the logistics and reliance that they have in other economies and so forth and so what you tend to see during those periods it's not only conflict between economies number one um, but also you tend to see economies actually building up or or revamping their manufacturing plants. So you now that brought to my attention when i was writing the letter i was really thinking about what was the last time we've seen an infrastructure development in the U.S. And what are we seeing today relative to history? Is that really big compared to other periods? And I was shocked to see the numbers. Uh, number one, if you look at the Marshall Plan uh, after the World War II for the rebuild of, of, uh, of the European countries and the global economy overall, um, and also the rest of the, the world actually uh, uh, is spending, overall spending in construction that we saw coming out of the World War II, um, the, the amount of infrastructure development we're seeing today in terms of the bill that was passed that will still be spent on construction completely dwarfs the amount that we saw back in those days. I mean, as you can see in this chart, I can see very well, but it's about $550 billion, call it. You know, it's about three times. And I act, you know, Kevin actually made the point. It's like, Tavi, why don't you add the Inflation Act uh, to, uh, to, uh, to this, the Inflation Reduction Act to this calculation? And I... You know, after doing further research, indeed, I mean, the majority of the Inflation Act, believe it or not, is actually going to the Green Revolution idea. What is the Green Revolution? Well, we're going to have to uh, rebuild a lot of things, uh, one of them being the electrical grids and uh, all sorts of, uh, of, of electrification policies that we're going to need in order to accommodate those, those changes. And therefore, uh, that is another form of construction. That is another form of, of demand for, for copper and other base metals that Quinton will talk about in a minute here. And and so it is important if we consider that as as a portion of the overall infrastructure spending that we're seeing today in terms of the 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 acts that have been passed by uh, by the government. It is a uh, you know again it completely dwarfs other periods. What is another period that we saw that was a very large was actually kind of in line with the Marshall Plan was in 1956, which was uh, Eisenhower actually passed an act. Uh, to for an infrastructure act that was called the Highway Act, I should be specific. It was about about twenty five billion dollars authorized by the government to spend on infrastructure developments. And you know, if you look at, by the way, all these numbers before people try to correct me, all these numbers are looked into inflation adjusted. So I adjusted for U.S. dollars today because that's the right thing to do. Um, and by the way, the second bar that you're seeing that I showed three times. That is global spending. That's not U.S. spending. That's global spending. So, the the yellow line is just the U.S. I'm not considering, you know, any European country, uh, country or any uh, or Canadian, uh, uh, the Canadian economy or Japan or 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 Australia. I think all of them are going to follow suit personally, and I think this uh, yellow bar. If you aggregate all the countries, it's going to look, um, you know, really interesting in a few years. Let's go to the next chart. Because I had another important chart in the prior letter, which was related to the infrastructure development and the construction spending is, is actually surging. That's the red line. You're looking specifically at manufacturing. It's about $200 billion. It's really not that much. Uh, if you think about it, we're going to see probably a lot more. Uh, and if you calculate how much you know the act has been uh, already passed, and this is just public spending. What about private spending? Private spending is also going to play a role here. And so... You know, you can extrapolate in different ways. What about another thing that we talked about in the letter uh, that also Kevin actually brought it up that point regarding data centers? Uh, you know, we're going to have a, a rebuild of AI. And I actually think AI is, is very deflationary. I, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. I think it's it's highly deflationary. But let me put it this way. In order to become deflationary, I think we need to first 
uh, uh, build up the infrastructure that is necessary to allow that to uh, manifest itself in the economy. And as we see that, it requires a lot of data centers. It requires a lot of chips. It requires a lot of things. And so uh, the infrastructure development that will be needed to uh, get AI to that uh, magnitude of, of, of a trend in, on the deflationary aspect um, is or disinflationary aspect um, is is what's likely to act, actually drive inflation. Uh, believe it or not, and that's the irony of this whole situation is that it's it's highly inflationary the process to get there. And so uh, that's the red line you're looking at, and the white line you're just looking at how much producers, uh, the, the the companies we invest in, are spending on new investments or 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 new projects or new uh, forms of, uh, of of production of hard assets to allow the, the red line to be built. Uh, in other words, construction to be built. And so, you know, there is a gap. Uh, we're probably going to see shortages of materials. And that's why you see every now and then a commodity surging in prices because of a lack of supply. And then people say, well, that's a unique factor with this and uh, whatever. I was, I was I tweeted the other day a chart of agricultural commodities. Somebody came up to me and said, well, that's just specific to cocoa. No, it's not. It, have you noticed how it switches over time? It's always one new commodity, but overall the trend is higher. That's what's been happening. And so that hasn't changed at all. So pay attention to those things. It's the same thing happening with, you know, the labor strikes. You know, labor strikes, people like to say that those are specific to situations with certain um, uh, either countries or, or, or companies. But no, they are uh, interconnected in a very large way and probably the beginning of more of those of those trends uh, continue to escalate globally. Let's go to the next chart. So copper to S&P 500 ratio, that's just an interesting chart because if we're going to see that infrastructure development, that demand coming in, Kevin had a chart of discoveries of, of copper. Quentin is going to touch on this as well. Well, how interesting is the fact that back in the early 2000s, I was mentioning there the, the link between today's market in gold versus early 2000s. Look at the re relationship there as well with the copper to S&P 500 ratio in which was rising during that period drastically. And it was just one economy, China, was going through their own manufacturing revamp. What if we see this more globally this time? You know, what does that do to copper? What does that do to hard assets relative to financial assets? Those are very important questions on that rotation uh, thesis that Kevin was mentioning. Let's go to the next chart. Um, here it is, uh, you know, I, I happen to know one, one company that produces a lot of zinc um um and uh happen i happen to be not only Crescat's investors but also uh we're also investors of uh, of uh, of this of this uh this operation and so uh it is interesting to see how uh zinc exploration budget if you adjust for gdp is actually down 70 percent 70 percent uh from its peak levels it's sort of it's mind-boggling what do you think that causes you know that usually uh, well, we're probably going to have the impact has a lagging effect uh, on on the supply of commodities, and Quinton will touch on that soon. Uh, but you know, this is another way to kind of uh, show how uh, you know we're seeing a highly constrained supply environment for commodities overall. Let's go to the next chart. Um, here it is: inflation versus agricultural commodities. I find this chart interesting because I really believe in the thesis that we're about to see. Uh, a second wave of inflation. I think three months ago it was very hard to make that call, and now it's becoming more evident. And one of the things that is actually pushing this potential for a, a reacceleration of inflation is actually agricultural commodities. They are actually up about 20% or 21% to be specific uh, on an annual basis. And guess what? They have a three month lead on CPI. So you know, in our opinion, this is actually going to lead to higher inflation because it has an impact on food prices and all sorts of things. And so it's not just cocoa. It's probably going to be a lot of other things, uh, including cattle prices and, and move, you know, on and on from, from different types of commodities that, that could be linked to uh, food prices and other things that are inflationary as well. Let's go to the next chart. And so if there's a second wave of inflation, I've never seen one that, or maybe there are a few in the past in, in history, but um, certainly energy is very likely to to participate on that. And energy, I you know when I show this chart, actually Kevin uh, correct me and said, look, you know, you can look at this in a, in a much 
you know, longer uh, period of time. And you can see that the relationship is, is a little bit different. I think my main point about this chart is that the energy equities have been very resilient. And energy equities are actually retesting the highs of that the Russian invasion period when, you know, when commodities really had a peak. And if you look at the blue line, which is specifically oil, oil is basically has a 50% implied move if we're going to go back to those levels. And I do think that's likely to happen. And, you know, when I look at the cost of betting on that, meaning the call options on a $100 strike on oil, and it's a, one of the lowest levels in history, well, okay, well, that's, you know, that that means nobody believes that we're going to see anything like that. And I, you know, I'm contrary at heart, and if I have a view that we're going to see inflation reaccelerating, well, I'd like that. I, I think that a call option on, on oil or energy companies are actually going to uh, uh, be the benefiters of, of this environment. Let's go to the next chart. And so the next chart now is showing something that concerns me. And, and that, you know, I, I think some people have been calling the Fed political. Um, and I'm going to get into that because that, that's not the point of Kraskin. That's not the point of what we do. We're not political. We're, you know, just macro data driven. But it is weird to see this, this, this shift in focus from inflation to labor markets from the Fed. And, and they have all their reasons to go there because there is this acceleration on the labor markets. Now, on the inflation front, there's nothing to be celebrating. The white line here is showing the uh, inflation expectation chart, and it's clearly on an upward trajectory. I mean, I, I don't think you need to be a PhD to see this. And on the other side, you have um, the uh, financial conditions chart in red has been declining. So one is actually, uh, you know, adding fuel to the fire of the white line. And I'm I'm concerned. I do think that this adds to that reacceleration of inflation thesis. I didn't think the Fed was going to, you know, pivot that quickly, honestly. I, I thought that the focus on inflation was much higher, uh, at least for longer. But in fact, I think that the big story is not interest rates higher for longer. It's really inflation higher for longer is the real risk here. So let's go to the next chart. Uh, and by the way, that's at the core of, uh, of of our views in a lot of things. And you now, one chart that I was I was going back and kind of reordering our, our macro presentations, I'm going through all these charts that we we had. And this chart still is in my mind. It's it basically looks at the the rising cost of debt. So you know the the impact of interest rates higher uh, being higher is is that the serve the cost to service the debt is higher. So therefore, you know we're we're you know three percentage basically three percentage points of GDP just to pay down the debt think about that and at the same time the red line is showing how much the government is actually or I should say the Fed is is really uh, uh, owns uh, still owns uh, of, of US treasuries and and as as the market as as the government floods the market with treasuries and the Fed is actually doing QT what we're seeing is that is is that the ownership of the Fed on treasuries has actually been declining so this is completely unsustainable because we know that if the if the white line keeps going up, then the red line needs to go up because somebody has to be responsible for this. And so, you know, ultimately, that's the whole reason why we believe that hard assets are likely to do very well. It's because the Fed is likely to be responsible for the white line in this chart and the cost of the debt uh, is going to have to be suppressed at some point. When the cost of debt has to be suppressed with inflationary forces embedded in the economy, that is a very explosive combination for hard assets. And so this is why I and I love talking about that. But let's go to the next chart. All right. So growth versus uh, equal weighted S&P. Very interesting chart. Just a double top uh, because um, I, you know, uh, I do believe in this rotation thesis. Uh, we just had a call with a with, with a client of ours and we've we've been a uh, uh, you know, very vocal about this rotation idea. And I do think that money has to come out of somewhere in order to come into somewhere else. And, and you know, I think technology has to be uh, serving the, the, the resource space at some point here in terms of the capital uh, flowing into uh, commodity businesses. And so, you know, I pay attention to uh, things that are very overvalued too. And, and that's one of them, growth stocks. And guess what's most, the biggest part of growth stocks? Technology and consumer discretionary. Those 
those are the the real uh i guess uh problem child in our, uh in in the in in the s p 500 today or in in the us equity markets in terms of valuation and and declining growth and 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 so forth and so uh, that that to us is is where the risk is it really is uh you know pulls in, in the economy let's go to the next chart um, and so you got insider selling, uh, uh, insiders selling their stocks in, in the technology space. I guess Peter Thiel was one of them and you had Jeff Bezos being another one and Mark Zuckerberg being another one. So, you know, the list of folks doing those those types of uh, of making those types of decisions is is certainly not short. And, and you should be aware of that. And then if I would point out to one of them that is, I might view one of the smartest investors out there is Peter Thiel. You know, if if the guy is 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 making a a move on 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 reducing his exposure to technology, I think you should you should at least take note of that because he's he's a really smart investor, and I I pay attention to uh, to him very very closely. Let's go to the next chart. I promise, I'm almost done. Uh, here's an interesting chart uh, about the S and P 500 relative to uh, the uh, the CPI, basically real term S and P 500, and you can see this channel. Now I would have probably done this chart a little bit different i'll probably do a channel although that's obvious because of the circles i would probably design this a little bit different but it's a great chart and that's why i have it here and you can see here that we're probably at this kind of you know upper side of that channel as well by the way if you look at earnings in real terms it looks exactly the same way you know earnings have been up and you know we're likely at the very uh, kind of near a pivotal moment for for earnings to start contracting as well they have started contracting a lot of companies and and you know and so the company or uh, stock prices should follow as well. Let's go to the next chart. And uh, my last point is is an idea, um, you know that that we've been thinking about a lot about. At least I've been thinking a lot about is, you know, the Fed is turning dovish uh, clearly, and and you can call it political or Fed is forced to do it and so forth. But they've they've turned dovish, and so you know the, this idea that we're going to see higher interest rates in the short term, uh, and, and the short side. Of the market of the treasury market, um, uh, short duration treasuries is is less likely. And the other side of it is that inflation is reaccelerating, so that increases the the pressure on the ten year yield to rise. So what is the idea that comes to my mind? It's in the next chart. It's the steepening of the yield curve. Um, if you have a Fed that is not willing to go and chase inflation, and you have inflation reaccelerating, causing the forces of the long term trend on treasuries to actually increase the long term yields of those treasuries uh, on top of knowing that central banks are actually foreign central banks are are not participating in this market as much as they used to in the past and also knowing that the 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 the, the yield curve has been as inverted as has been in history and in, 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 in the most inverted has been in history in terms of timing um i believe strongly that we're going to see a very uh, a strong steepening of of the two versus thirties or the two versus tens on the yield curve spread, and I think this is an interesting trade, and and it may happen actually in other countries too, not just the U.S. But the U.S. is the main one, and and certainly looks very attractive. And I think that's a kind of a recession play. If you look at the other part times in history when uh, the yield curve is steepening after being deeply inverted, well, those are times. Uh, you also um, uh, need to be careful because that's usually aligned with the recession. So, Quentin, take it away from here. I think that's my last chart, uh, okay. and that's it. All right. Well, I got some homework for people this week. Now, the first thing I got to say, though, it's really hard to follow somebody with a tie as hot as that. Man, that's a that's a nice looking tie, Toby. That's a beauty. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> I don't think. I I don't think I have a tie in my entire collection of three ties that holds a candle to that tie. <laughs> I'll give you this one then. All right. <laughs> pick, pick me up another tie like that, wherever you are. I think in Italy or something. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Like the homework assignment this week, because it's a long weekend, I think uh, a lot of you who watch this video might appreciate uh, a particular uh, video series on YouTube. It's one of my favorite. Okay, it's it's Gary the Goat. And if you don't know Gary the Goat, you need to look up Gary the Goat. One of my favorite episodes is when they get stuck along the side of the road and his boot gets stuck in the mud. And he has to have a guy pull pull out his boot uh, using a tow, tow rope. <laughs> anyway, Google uh, or not 
Google, but go on YouTube, type Gary the Goat has trouble down under. You'll see, you can watch it for yourself. It's a pretty funny movie. But it it's it's a metaphor or it's a, an, an analogy for what's happening today. Gold is taken off, like you guys said. Um, you pointed out that gold's broken out here. And it's fortunately seeming to pull along uh, silver and the base metals now um, with it. Okay, now last week I talked extensively about silver. You know, silver is Tobby's favorite. And, you know, this constant demand that we find more silver, you know, is, is getting a little fatiguing. So every once in a while I like to look at base <laughs> metals too, you know, just, just for giggles. Uh, but uh, this week I'm going to talk about base metals. I'm going to talk about, you know, base metals, uh, you know, a little, a, a few basics on, on the base metals, but also um, what exposure we have uh, through our exploration portfolio. Okay. So go to the next slide. Quentin, this picture is by, absolutely fabulous, by the way. Really, really good stuff. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's really good. <laughs> so, um, look, you know, base metals uh, are, are loosely defined as, as the metals you see in, with the red circles here. Now, a lot of people will say, well, what about nickel and cobalt? And, oh, yeah, yeah, they're kind of base metals. But I consider everything to the left of copper kind of more of a ferro alloy metal, okay? Like, usually copper and nickel and – or excuse me, nickel and cobalt and such, manganese, chromium, vanadium, titanium, those are all alloyed with, uh, you know, in steel. So in iron uh, to make various, you know, types of steel that, that have different purposes. So those are the ferro alloy metals. And then we have over here copper and zinc uh, with the big red circles. Lead's down there kind of apparently by itself uh, in column number 14. I would also throw tin in here. A lot of people forget, but tin is uh, traditionally considered a base metal. You look at the, you know, the the fact that uh, tin alloyed with copper is bronze. Okay, and in human history, you know, bronze was one of the first uh, uses of metal that we have in in on record. All right, so it is an important base metal. Although most people don't even think so much about tin today, but it's important. Okay, go to the next slide. All right, so I'm going to talk about copper first, and I'm just going to give a few basics. I'm not going to do a huge deep dive here, but, you know, this is more for just a, a basic education and, uh, you know, for people watching this video so you understand, you know, where copper comes from, but also, um, you know, why we, we're going to need it going forward. And I'll show you a slide in a second that will make that impression. Right now, you know, we produce about 22 million metric tons per year. It, I've seen different numbers, but this this looks reasonably accurate. Okay, 22 million tons, uh, metric tons of copper in in a year in 2023. It's been kind of flat or slowly rising uh, here recently. You know, notice that between say uh, what is that 2016 and 2020, it was pretty flat. Okay, we're seeing a slight increase here lately, but it's not taken off. You know, like like a lot of us, uh, a lot of folks say. We're going to need to see in order to, you know, sustain a lot of the things that uh, that Tavi mentioned a minute ago, like this, you know, these basically um, infrastructure spends and stuff. Let alone things like EVs and stuff like that. So I would say copper is going to be in high demand, and we're going to have to see this growth in production. Okay, now you have to say, well, okay, let's let's dig a little deeper. Let's go to the next slide, and we're going to. First of all, talk about what are the main uses for copper. And look, this isn't exclusive. This isn't the thorough list. But mainly copper uh, uses is, is in things like to pipe, you know, water piping and for buildings, construction, as well as wire, okay, and mainly in electronics. So a lot of copper is used in electronics and wiring, obviously, you know, transmission and such. such. So those are the big, big uses of copper right there. Go to the next slide. Um, this shows you the, the production of copper from different countries around the world. Chile has had a commanding position in copper production over many, many years. In fact, many decades now. Um, but it's kind of slipping lately. It's, it, it leveled off a few years ago. And now it's starting to actually slip back recently, which is interesting. Okay, Part of that is a of not exploring or not capitalizing new mines and such. Okay, So that, that's definitely a, at play. It's still number one, but, you know, it could gradually slip over time if they don't kind of, you know, get their, uh, you know, get 
an environment back where it's it's good to you know for investment in copper space building new mines and exploring and such you know peru has actually been growing here recently it's uh the second on the list it's at 10.5 percent not as anywhere close to chile but it's a significant producer okay china as well now the thing with china is always always hard to see or say how much of that copper production is actually coming from china it might as opposed to maybe you know copper coming in a, in the form of concentrates into China and then getting counted uh, as Chinese production, but you know the data is what it is. It's, uh, it says about eight point six percent of world copper uh, is produced uh, from China. Uh, Congo, big producer, and that's actually grown here recently. Obviously, you know with Friedland uh, starting up his mine. Um, Congo is is kind of jumped back into the the one of the top spots here. I think we're going to see you know that African copper belt um, be a juggernaut for copper going forward. Whether it displaces you know Chile and Peru kind of gets up to that level, eh, I'm a little doubtful. You never know though. You never know. Okay, uh, United States we're at a piddly little five point seven percent, which is a terrible shame, guys. I mean it is such a shame because we here in the United States have some absolutely hands down world class copper deposits that should be in production, in my my opinion. Okay, they just they should be in production. We could be one of the major copper producers. We'd probably be, we'd probably outgun Peru if things like the Resolution Mine was online down in Arizona, or Pebble in Alaska, and others. You know, like the up in the Duluth complex in Minnesota, if those projects were allowed to advance. We are where we are. It's unfortunate that we don't take advantage of our own uh, resources and, you know, blessed, you know, mineral endowment, but we don't. Um, we won't get into politics here, but uh, darn. Um, Australia, Zambia, you can see the rest of them, okay? Indonesia, yeah, mainly, that's mainly accounted for by Grossberg, Gertzberg. Um, there's a lot of potential in, in Batu Hijau, uh, but there's a lot of potential in Indonesia. That's one country where, boy, they ever got their act together, they could actually blow the lid off of copper. Like you could see them climb to a uh, second spot very quickly if they reformed and got their their act together. All right, all right. Let's uh, let's go to the next slide and let's dig into the copper production profile looking forward. Okay, this chart's a little bit out of date, so this is, you know. Um, you know, a, a few years old is Kerr. I think it's 2014. Yeah, Kerr. Uh, but uh, it shows you that there's a peak, or they forecasted a peak just a few years ago, about 10 years ago. They forecast a peak in the 20, 2030 uh, period, somewhere in there. Now, it turns out that peak's actually, you know, very close in time to us right now. And you can see how everything rolls over and falls off. Well, that's because if you just look at the reserves um, that we have in these different countries and different mines in these countries, you know, that is just a natural phenomenon. Now, a lot of people jump and say, oh, that's peak copper. No, peak copper. No, no, we can we can do something about this. Okay, this is, it's not peak copper. We need to explore. We need to develop new deposits. Okay, that's how you avoid peak copper. But uh, this is kind of a perspective, and it shows you, you know, the, the profile of different countries and how they're going to diminish over time. And I think that's an accurate statement. You know, like, um you know, Chile's going to taper off pretty quick from here, you know, things like that. So what do we need to do? We need to build new mines or, or come up with new uh, solutions for extracting more copper from low-grade material. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, top 20 copper mines. This comes from Elements. Um, look, you can see it's kind of a little bit skewed. You kind of have to hold your head funny, but uh, you can see where the big mines are. Many of them are along the western margin of North and South America in the Circum Pacific Belt. And then you can even jump over, uh, like I said, Grossberg is over there in Indonesia. Uh, it's over uh, up on the top, actually, in this image. But uh, that's also part of the Circum Pacific Belt. And then you look at it and you say, well, what is that stuff in Africa? The little bars there, that's the African Copper Belt. Those are where the big mines are there. And we even have uh, one very large uh, deposit in the top 10 or top 20 list in Russia. Okay, let's go to the next slide and look at these things and just look at where, where they are or what they are. Um, most of these are porphyries. 
Okay, I put pink dots next to the uh, sediment host. Hopefully I didn't miss any. I don't think I did, but maybe I did. Um, I put a little pink dots next to the sedimentary copper deposits and their contribution. One thing I noticed, though, um, they didn't look at uh, Poland, which I found interesting. I don't know if they're treating it as separate mines and therefore it doesn't you know, hit the top 20 list, but in aggregate, Poland actually would be on this list and it would be sedimentary copper, but that's not how they broke it down in this table. So I can't do much about it. But, uh, but anyway, the point is a lot of the deposits out there, a lot of the ones that produce the, the big tonnage of copper on a yearly basis are porphyries. Okay. They're porphyries. Now it's not to say sedimentary copper isn't important. It also is, it could, we could see growth in that production. Like I said, if Friedland and others in Central Africa have anything to do about it, we might see a lot more sedimentary copper come about. But this is uh, this gives you a picture of where most of the copper comes from. Porphyry, porphyry, porphyry. All right, go to the next slide. And I just put this image together. Like last week, I showed you where or what type of deposits um, the metal comes from. Last week, silver, you know, the whole spectrum of deposits. But in copper world, Really, it's just porphyries and sedimentary copper deposits. Those are the biggies, okay? I, I've also put VMS on here. It's it's a lesser uh, co contributor. You know, we didn't see any mines in the top um, 20 list uh, there. But uh, in reality, you know, some of the deposits, even in Africa, there are VMS. So I do think it's a worthwhile target. But this is this, these are the kind of copper stories that, we like to invest in. Okay, so here at Crestcat, what do we have? We have investments in a number of porphyry copper plays. Uh, look at Brixton. Look at uh, look at you know BCM in, in Utah. Look at Bell Copper in in Arizona. Even Barksdale. I mean, in a sense, Barksdale is proximal to the porphyry environment. Uh, it's kind of porphyry CRD target there, but it is a, a copper story by and large. Um, okay, so we and we have others, but look. The point is we have exposure. We have significant exposure. I think roughly 15% uh, or so of our portfolio at this time is exposure mainly to porphyry copper deposits. Now, do we have any sedimentary copper? Yes. Last week I mentioned Hannon in the, on the east side of the Andes in Peru is exploring for sedimentary copper. I discussed it in reference to silver last week, but it's equally a very impressive copper target, uh, you know, like, five meters or six meters. I think it was a 3% copper embedded form. Um, boy, when you start talking those kind of grades, it adds up very quick. Okay. So we do have exposure to sedimentary copper. We also have exposure to, to, to VMS in some cases. Now won't, won't take time right now, but let's plow forward, talk about, there we go, where we're looking. All right. Um, this world map shows you uh, a distribution of sedimentary hosted copper deposits as well as porphyry copper deposits. And I've drawn circles. Um, basically, green are areas we, we consider perspective and favorable for investing in copper stories. Um, these are places where mines have been built. You know, there's de demonstrable evidence that mines can be built in those locations as well as the discovery of of major, major copper systems. The yellow areas are areas where, you know, for some, you know, one reason or another, maybe cost or, you know, other aspects uh, make it a bit more or a bit less perspective uh, as in terms of an investment, but we're still open to considering. I'm open to considering looking at opportunities in those locations. Red, unfortunately, no-go areas, okay? You know, a lot of people ask us about uh, things in Africa from time to time. Like there was a gold discovery this week in Africa that everybody um, is quite excited about, and for good reason. It looks like a very good one. Uh, but we we typically shy away from investment in Africa just because of the jurisdictional risks. Okay, I'm, I'm not trying to poke, you know, or degrade any country in Africa in particular. It's just we we as investors – uh, prefer not to invest in Africa, okay, even though there is, in this case, good copper potential there, all right? All right, but let's talk about the, the most favorable areas, okay? So I'm going to start over here in North and South America. So if you look at the U.S., um, you know, Western U.S., great endowment of copper. We actually have a huge position, almost half of the Butte Mining District under our control in a private company called Blackjack Silver. Yeah, it's called silver, but in fact, it's associated with the porphyry copper. 
So it's one of the biggest porphyry coppers in the United States. We're invested in that, okay? But we we have those other investments that I mentioned too. Um, uh, stake in uh, BCM and Bell Copper and such. Um, the Western U.S., in spite of the fact that we haven't seen a lot of big, big mines built recently, is still highly prospective for copper. copper. It's a, a you know first world jurisdiction. We need to see the permitting regime improve, in my view. Uh, but otherwise, I do think if you take a, a bit longer term view, I think there's a lot of value to investing in copper stories in the U.S. Same for British Columbia and the Yukon. Lots of good copper stories there. We have a number of them that are rambled off. Pacific Ridge, Brixton, you know, such. Like these are, are big targets, big targets that could have huge endowments, say a million tons plus of copper. And in some cases, a lot of gold too. Um, you know, in the case of Clayhul at Pacific Ridge, a lot of gold comes with that, a few million ounces perhaps. All right, now um, Alaska is also highly prospective. All right, and one of the one of the VMS stories that we have is the S or Silver Forty Seven story that took in all of the assets that um, White Rock used to have in Central Alaska, and now they're going to be advancing those those VMS systems. And I would encourage people to look at the the information for Silver Forty Seven because there is very high grade copper uh, VMS discovery there. They found it in, in float samples, like pieces of rock, uh, but it looks really intriguing, and I do think the company's going to drill it this year. So those three circles in North America, those are areas where I consider, you know, investing in uh, coppers is worthwhile. Uh, less so in Mexico. I'm uh, president in Mexico, just, boy, banning open pit. That's Don't start talking like that. So I kind of downgraded Mexico, the you know, central part of the U.S. Uh, where there's sedimentary copper potential. It's interesting. I haven't seen any compelling, you know, investment cases lately for investing, say, you know, in Michigan or somewhere like that. But there is good copper, sedimentary copper. Um, there is sedimentary copper up in none of it, too. And I wouldn't I wouldn't mind dipping my toe in there. I, I do think it's expensive to work in none of it. But even over in eastern Canada, you know, in, in uh, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, those are good places to look as well. Uh, mainly for VMS. Now, down in South America, I'm really feeling good about uh, investment in Argentina at this point. I think the pol political situation there has improved dramatically. And I really think if, if there's listeners out there and you want to start thinking about copper exposure, like look at a lot of the copper stories. Uh, you know, we're involved with uh, Magotes, for example, private company. It should go public here soon. It's immediately adjacent to to the Philo discovery. Okay, like this is, and the geology looks fantastic. I talked about it a few weeks ago. Okay, so there's really good opportunity in Argentina, but I also see that continue up in Peru. Peru has done a 180. They've improved the mining space tremendously over the past year. All of a sudden, permits are coming out very quickly. It doesn't take you two or three years to get an idea. You can get a permit in Peru very quickly, probably within two, three, four months. At this point, that is a wonderful outcome. And that because of that, I'm very keen on seeing investment in Peru once again. Panama, look at what happened to first quantum. No go zone for a while. Uh, most of Central uh, or Latin, Central Latin America. Um, no, we're not going there. OK, um, even Colombia. Have, have there been any big copper mines built in Colombia? Eh, not really. OK, um, Colombia has great potential, but we're not seeing the mines get built, nor are we seeing them advance in places like the Dominican Republic and the Caribbean. Unfortunately, great copper deposits, but until we see that, uh, what was it, Romero uh, deposit developed, I can't see investing over there. All right, Australia, certainly, okay, any day. It is kind of high cost in Australia. It's, you know, it's a bit daunting, but along the eastern margin of the country, there are a lot of old, older porphyry belts. This isn't Circum Pacific stuff. This is older uh, porphyry belts, uh, such as down in New South Wales, where inflection, one of our investments, inflection is working, okay? Um, big, big porphyry discoveries and mines. You've got Cadia and, and such, uh, North Parks and stuff. These are massive, world-class copper deposits. So, yes, Australia, no problem. Um, the Oceania area, you know, from New Guinea over through the various islands, um, a bit of caution, but I'm actually thinking that's a good place to be at this point. And I went and looked at some stuff. Couldn't get a deal done there last year, but I am kind of keen on the prospectivity there, but also the ability to work. Same in Japan and Southeast Asia. I think there's merit in looking 
at uh, opportunities in those locations. Up in Europe, uh, mainly in Southeast Europe, um, there's porphyry potential. Okay? Uh, there's also sedimentary copper potential, but mostly I'm interested in the porphyry potential in Southeast Europe. Uh, up in Scandinavia, that one green circle that's way up in the upper left, great VMS potential. And also IOCG potential. I didn't talk about IOCGs. You know, yes, they are an important copper contributor, but they're not a major, major one like you could see in the top 20 mines. Yeah, you know, there's none in the list there, but but they are important, and there are some really good opportunities up in uh, Scandinavia. All right, so that's the way I think about copper, and those are the areas that we're focused. We do have a lot of investments already inside those green circles, and over time, we'll probably be taking some more. All right, um, let's go to the next slide. Now I'm going to talk about lead and zinc. I'm not going to Again, it'll be an abridged version, um, but these two charts are similar to what I showed for copper. Again, this apparent peak that comes off. Um, in this case, you can see the scale's a bit different there. So each tick mark on the bottom uh, axis there is 50 years. And you can see how, yeah, things fall off actually fairly steeply for lead and even for zinc. Okay, in, you know, in the next few years, we haven't explored for these metals. Tavi just showed you a picture of the decline in the investment in exploration or exploring for zinc. It's like crazy. It's gone to practically nothing lately. Okay. So we as geologists, as well as the you know support we've get, gotten from the financial community has been bugger all. And we've basically shot ourselves in the foot. And I think if there's any metal, we'll call it unloved metal out there that I'm really focused on right now is zinc. I'm, I'm telling you, we've, we've failed to explore for it. The decline in zinc uh, resources is going to be very sharp, and we need to take advantage of it, okay? And that's one of the reasons we picked up um, San Cristobal like we did. We are we are the 15th largest zinc producer, I believe, right now. Okay, we're huge. But we need to look for more. We need to do more things. In fact, you know, we are looking at other, uh, other opportunities, uh, acquisitions. Um, we're looking at some, you know, elsewhere in the world right now. Um, We'll talk, talk a little bit about that maybe in a couple of slides. Go to the next one. Okay, what are what are these metals used for? What the heck is lead used for? Well, batteries, okay? <laughs> Everybody's got a battery in their, their car, a 12-volt battery. Yeah, that's where most lead goes. Now, a lot of that gets recycled, okay? So you do see a lot of recycling of, of lead, uh, and it's reused in, in, in batteries. Um, but it, it's the dominant use. Now you might say, well, geez, that's uh, kind of a dead end. And you know what, if EVs take over and look, there is some need for batteries in EVs, like they need a little 12 volt, volt battery, a lot of them, but you're not going to see the demand for lead be so high in the future. Probably. Okay. That's the bet of many folks. And therefore lead might be like the dodo bird <laughs> over time. Um, the uses for it might be less and less and less, which means, hmm, that's interesting uh, because lead's mined often with zinc. Okay, that's why you see both of them on this chart here. Lead and zinc deposits almost always go hand in hand. Very seldom do you find a lead deposit or zinc pure deposit, something like that. They're almost always together. Okay, so it's an interesting dynamic. If, if we don't need so much lead in the future, but we need things like zinc and silver and such, then it's kind of weird because you're mining um, those metals, but you're really mining lead just as a, you know, a way to carry your silver, for example, or something like the whole dynamic shifts as we see a, a reduction in, in lead demand topic for another time, maybe, but uh, it is something to, to stick in your memory uh, bank there and consider now zinc uh, use on the other hand, ain't going away anytime soon. And what's most zinc used for galvanizing. Okay. Galvanizing is when you coat, steel with a thin film of zinc metal and it's basically what keeps steel or iron from rusting away okay if we didn't have zinc um all of the buildings we had all this steel that we use for various things you know cars and such would rust away very quickly okay it's very important that we galvanize uh anything made out of iron almost uh, because if you don't it will degrade over time very quickly over time so zinc is basically a key element in keeping civilization propped up, okay? And you're not going to see, like even if the economy contracts a bit, you're not going to see that diminish. You, you got to keep coating stuff in zinc. 
or you get in trouble quick. Okay, so I think zinc's got a good future ahead of it. Yeah, it's used for alloys and other things, but mostly galvanizing. All right, let's go to the next slide. Here's where it comes from. China, huge producer of zinc. Again, how much of that is actually attributable to uh, mines in China? Uh, for debate, I think a lot of the 32.6% is actually concentrates that are brought in from other countries, maybe not quite in ways we know. <laughs> uh, but I do, you know, China is hands down the biggest zinc uh, producer and certainly smelter. Okay. Now, Peru, interestingly, is, is second, just like with copper. Peru is second. And, you know, it's a, a fraction of what China is, but it is an important zinc producer. Uh, Australia, big zinc production uh, from those sedimentary hosted deposits in the eastern part of Australia. India, no, not too many people think about it, but uh, VMS deposits in India uh, have a lot of zinc, and it's it's always been a big zinc producer. U.S., just like copper, if if we had our act together, we would have lots more zinc production. Unfortunately, we've dwindled down to less than 6% of the world's share of the zinc production, and I find that very disturbing. You know, most of it comes from Red, Red Dog, which is a, a sedimentary zinc deposit in Alaska. Uh, otherwise, uh, a lot of zinc production in the U.S. is, you know, just from dribs and drabs from various mines, um, you know, mainly for silver and such. such. We need to see a revitalization. Uh, Mexico is also a significant zinc producer, uh, mainly CRDs and things like that. But, uh, you know, again, I think there's a lot of potential that's untapped. Bolivia, wonderful place. We are in Bolivia now. I, I'm going to make a prediction. As time goes on, I think we can make Bolivia, uh, we can push Bolivia up as we, uh, San Cristobal, will operate there, I think, and then take advantage of other opportunities. You know, even, even some of our investments, like El Oro, for example, as they develop that project, we'll see Bolivia become a, a bigger and bigger zinc producer. It could be second or third over time. Let's go to the next slide. Here's the largest uh, zinc deposits. Um, you can see Red Dog, that one I mentioned earlier, Tech. Uh, it's in Alaska, okay, and it's been producing for just year after year, like just crazy numbers, super high grade, highly profitable mine. Um, it produces a whopping half million tons of zinc metal per year out of a approximately 14 million ton per annum worldwide production. So it is a, a major, major producer. And then you can see right right below there is uh, uh, Hindustan Zinc. That's uh, I said VMS earlier. I meant to say sedimentary exhalative. Uh, then you got the big systems in Australia. Um, you know Glencore's operations, and then mm, Antamina. That's a scarn. Okay, so sometimes around porphyries, remember you get scarn immediately adjacent to the porphyry, and then CRDs outboard from that. You can get some systems with a big zinc endowment, and Antamina is one of those. Okay. And, I find that very interesting because um, I think there could be more Antaminas in per Peru that could be exploited. That might be one of the things we're working on. Okay. Um, again, look, I won't read them all off there, but you can get a sense. Most of these things are basically uh, sedimentary exhalative or some sort of scarn, you know, manto, vein, whatever, um, associated with porphyry. There's one VMS way down there at the bottom, Cerro Lindo. That's in Peru. All right, let's go to the next slide. So here's, like I didn't put VMS uh, per se on here, but I kind of include it up in that top, up, up, upper left, you know, like a submarine style deposit. I didn't write specifically VMS there, but most of the zinc deposits we have formed in subaqueous environments, either as SEDEX deposits or VMS deposits too or MVTs where you had fluids come up into the limestone reefs along the co the margins of the continents. Okay. They're not, they're not CRDs. They're a different type of deposit, but this is the location of most zinc formation on earth. Now you do get some, uh, in CRDs. Okay. You can get um, outboard from a porphyry. You can have scarns and CRDs, like I said earlier, and there's a lot of zinc in those. Some of those are world-class zinc deposits like that Antamina deposit I mentioned earlier. And then occasionally you do get zinc as an important component of porphyry deposits too. All right. All right. Let's go to the next, next slide. Okay. Where do, where do I like to look for zinc? Again, we got green, yellow, and red circles here. 
I really love most of North America for zinc exploration. And that goes from the, the Western, you know, margin, the Circum Pacific margin from Alaska down through the Western U.S. Lots of uh, porphyry deposits that also have a good shot of CRDs and things like that. So that belt is just a prolific zinc belt that I think is worth investing. Most people don't recognize, but in central U.S., there are MVT, Mississippi Valley type zinc deposits. Those are perspective. I have seen a few opportunities to invest in those, and maybe we jump in there at some point. And then over in the eastern seaboard uh, in Canada, you have VMS deposits. So I got a green circle there. Mexico, still hesitant about the president down there, but there are some wonderful CRD deposits, lots of zinc that are probably worth looking at. Um, up in the far, far north of Canada, there are some MVT and, and sedimentary hosted uh, zinc deposits, but man, is it expensive to work up there. So I put a yellow circle around that. Now, going down to South America, Peru, Bolivia, and even uh, northern Argentina and, and Chile, I think that's a great place to look for zinc. Okay, I, I'm very keen on that. I think all of those jurisdictions, particularly Bolivia and Peru, are wonderful places to operate right now. Uh, Argentina has also improved. You know, so I, I see those as winners. There is a belt of, of MVT deposits in, in Brazil. Maybe we look at Brazil there, Tommy. I don't know. All right. Uh, now, you, let's jump over to Europe. You say, well, why is there a green circle around Ireland? Uh, you say, oh, geez, um, you know what? Ireland is one of the biggest zinc districts on earth. And guess what? We are looking hard. Okay, I was in Ireland earlier this year. I really think Ireland could be re resumed to be one of the biggest zinc districts on earth. Very keen on that. I'm also keen on Scandinavia. Some of those VMS systems that host copper also host zinc. There's also potential throughout Europe. Southeast Europe, Spain, even Northern Africa, where there's a number of opportunities for zinc investment. I am liking it more because the European Union is putting a lot of pressure on countries now to develop their mineral resources. They're like, hey, you know, guys, we can't just export all our mining overseas. We got to start exploring, exploring and developing our own deposits. And that's a new trend. OK, that, that I think is a good trend. Asia, unfortunately, guys, you know what? I, I just can't see it investing in India, uh, certainly not Iran or Turkey, unfortunately, right now, certainly not China. Those ain't going to happen. Uh, but I'll tell you this. Um, there are some deposits in Iran that if they ever got developed, would probably flood the zinc market for the next decade or two. They are huge. <laughs> and it's, it's probably just as well we don't see them come online anytime soon. We'd probably see zinc at about 20 cents if they did. Okay, in Australia, absolutely. No question uh, looking at zinc opportunities there, especially sedimentary hosted ones like Moronin and others. Uh, Africa, look, all the, the, you know, best to Robert Friedland. I'll let him mess with with Africa, but that's just not a place I'm, I'm going to spend a lot of time or investment right now. But they do have some world-class zinc um, mines, and one of them is going to start later this year, all right? All right, so those are that's what I see, and, and, I, and I am looking. Uh, I'm looking. We're actively looking at opportunities to buy assets that we can, you know, do something that's similar uh, to San Cristobal, right? So there are zinc mines out there, cheap, and we might take advantage of that. All right, let's go to the next slide. We're going to get our skates on. This year, I would expect Crescat to maybe undertake or be party to an undertaking maybe two or three acquisitions, okay? It's my crystal ball. We're working away. Like I said last week, I've been one, busier than a one-armed paper hanger uh, working on some deals. And I would say by the end of this year, I'm not going to make them silver squirrel deals or so, you know, secret zinc deals or whatever, but we are working on some deals right now. All right, let's go to the next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, update or updates, a couple of updates, not too many. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, Sitka put out some news actually while I was putting this deck together. So fortunately, I saw it. Somebody emailed me and said, hey, wow, did you see this? Um, I was able to uh, put a few slides together to talk about the update they gave this morning. It looks like a pretty good update to me. Okay, they have started drilling. In fact, they've completed one hole, number 57. I think they're on to 58 now. And you can see where they're located with the green arrow there. 
and they are sticking to the script. Okay, we we put money in last November along with other parties, and they now have enough money they can go in and retest some of the high grade that they hit late last year. Okay, this is wonderful uh, reduced intrusion story. I really like it. I really like the team, and I think they're gonna they're gonna hit hit it this year. I think they're gonna hit something big in my view. It's just my gut, my instinct. Uh, but let's talk more about what they're trying to test. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Um, last year, they had a very high-grade intercept in hole number 47. You can see some of the numbers there. There's 55 meters inside of a broad interval. There's, I think it's 219 meters of 1.3 grams. But inside of that, there's 55 meters of a little over 3, three grams, almost a tenth of an ounce per ton. And then there's inside of that 14 meters of 5.5 grams within a, a high grade area that's down deep in that drill intercept. Okay, so it's pretty deep, but it's it's important. Geologic is very important. And one of the things we talked about with the company was retesting that area. And that's precisely what they did. The first drill hole they drilled, go to the next side, cuts across, but deeper through that, that same area. So you can see hole 47 right in the middle of the slide with the flags that have the assays. Okay, but hole 57 is the deeper one. It's, what, about 200 meters, I think, or change, maybe even a bit more deeper than um, hole 47. Okay, and this was a big test. This is a big, long hole. It's 550 meters or thereabouts, I think. And they actually saw a nice interval with veining and visible gold uh, down deep or down below that previous high grade. To me, that's a great outcome. Um, I I do think at some point this thing's going to blow out a bit more and there's going to be more involved. I also think that, that other dike-like thing they have over here to the, to the left could have some high grade developing at depth as well. That'll be tested here shortly, as I understand it. Um, now, what does this mean? Well, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a very long intercept reported out of this drill hole. Okay, now it probably will have a higher grade component to it where they see the VG down down towards the bottom. Yes, no problem. But look at all that lower grade material in the other holes, the earlier holes up top. You know, what what might come back? I, I don't know. Okay, but I think they we will see a very long intercept of reportable gold out of this hole that says, hey, this the volume of rock that we're looking at here that's mineralized is much, much bigger than previously thought. Okay, so hold tight. We don't know what the assays are, but they're seeing the same kind of things that we saw at Snowline with the veining, the specks of visible gold and such. This could have a very, very good outcome. Go to the next slide. Here's some of the core up at the top. Some of the mineralization was in the, the green, which were sedimentary rocks or metasedimentary rocks. And then they went into this uh, knobby, crowded porphyry intrusion, a monzonite intrusion. And if you look at the core down there in the bottom two rungs, there's a speckly rock. That's that intrusive rock. But notice there's some big quartz, uh, that kind of light gray or tan gray uh, stuff that you see there is big scale quartz painting. Look at that's huge. And in that, they see visible gold. So the photo over here on the right-hand side is some of the gold that they see in, in the quartz painting. I think that's very important. You know, when I saw this, I, I thought, wow, that's, that's uh, th to me, like visually, that looks more mineralized than the core from the intercept in hole 47, which was above. Okay, so I do think they're seeing a general improvement in, in the amount of veining and intensity, if you will, of the mineralization. Let's hope that ref is reflected by the gold grades here as well. Okay, so I, I'm pretty keen to see where this is going. But it got me to thinking about a project I worked on about 30 three years ago, 32 years ago, when I was a graduate school in School of Mines, I was trying to pay my bills. And uh, I did some side work for MK Gold, which is a Morrison Knudsen gold company. It was a gold, old gold company. It's not no longer around. But it was right after the Soviet Union collapsed. And they had a project in Kyrgyzstan. You could go to the next site called Zhuroi. And this uh, deposit, I, I found some data. It's really hard to find data on the internet. But it's a, a deposit in Kyrgyzstan that's been known about for a long, long time. The Russians found it, and they they drifted and tunneled and stuff, and they drilled, and you know they explored the bee jeepers out of this thing. And I was doing some work on a resource estimate for MK 
back in the period around 1992 or three, I think it was. And uh, you can see some of the numbers there. Okay. Um, down there with the green arrow. Um, and this is historic data guys, but there was a, a high grade component to that deposit. It was 11.2 million tons of 5.92 grams. And, and the current reserves, meaning, okay. Um, after we did the work, uh, they defined reserves. We came up, and those numbers are actually quoted down there. We came up with um, 9.88 million tons of 7.5 grams. So there was a really nice high-grade core to the thing. It's kind of a banana-shaped thing, if I remember right. And it was nearly vertical. But then there was a cloud of lower grade around it. And the resources around it were 25 million tons at 3.97 grams. And I thought, hmm. I mean, that's really not much tonnage. If you compare it to, say, snow line target where you got, you know, probably two or 300 million tons of rock there, you know, what this is, this is an extreme example of a more structurally controlled version of a reducive intrusive system. So what I'm saying is you can, you can take your gold and just, you know, blow it out through a big intrusion like at Snow Line and Valley and make a wonderful homogenous deposit. No problem. It's a wonderful mine or it would make a wonderful mine when it's put together. But then you can also get situations where the gold with the reduced intrusion is actually focused more in certain areas. And that veining that I'm seeing in those core uh, photos from today's news release, look guys, just my gut. Okay. I'm not promising anything, but it reminds me a lot of stuff I saw from Geroy many, many years ago, very intense quartz and, and thicker veins, little specks of VG through it. It looks very much like that. And it could be, it could be, I'm just telling people, you know, maybe the direction that um, this project takes is, you know, maybe you have a big cloud of low grade, but inside of that, you have some very high grade, maybe a few million tons or a few, you know, 20 million tons of higher grade. And that's the kind of thing you can get in some of these reduced intrusive systems. Wouldn't that be a cool outcome? Okay. Not a bad outcome, but you know, hey, that's, that's my two bits. We got to wait for assays. We got to wait for a lot of things, but I'm really hopeful they're kind of seeing something develop kind of like this. Let's go to the next slide. Newfound put some news out uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, very high grade results from this area they called Iceberg Alley, which is way off on the northeast limb of the iceberg area. Very high grades. They had 2.55 meters of 186 gram per ton gold. That's crazy. Okay. That's uh six ounce per ton gold. That's, you know, dollar wise, a ton of that rock is over, you know, it's almost $13,000 per ton. Let that set in your brain there. Everybody that kind of, you know, shrugs their shoulder and oh, yeah. what do they got here? Well, hell, hello. You don't need many tons of this to make a lot of gold guys. <laughs> and the photos here are Gorgeous. They remind me just, you know, they're spitting image of some of the high grade at Fosterville. This is amazing. Go to the next slide and I'll show you where this is at. It is way off. So if you look at the image on the left, you can see the blue box there. And Iceberg Alley is way up in the upper right corner there. So you have to go over here to the right hand side and you can see Iceberg Alley is tucked way up in the upper right corner of that image. And it's the extension, the fault. It's a faulted sliver that's shifted up. And it's the extension of the iceberg zone way, way off to the east. Nobody ever dreamed that there would be high-grade gold this far away from the Appleton Fault Corridor. But you remember that that gravity or uh, seismic data I showed a couple of weeks ago? And you think about all those little structures out that, that are evident in that uh, seismic data. And you think about this little vein way out here, way out in the, you know, Pajingas, way out uh, away from the Appleton Fault. Who knows what could be here? I mean, this is really encouraging. You could start to see extensions of veins way, way out from the Appleton Fault Corridor that have high grade. Okay, anybody who thinks this is a small you, you, you no, you, you're wrong. It's going to be a big one in my view. And, you know, you can take a six-ounce rock and build up a lot, of, a lot of ounces really, really quickly. Okay, so I'm, I'm very excited at what I'm seeing here. Go to the next slide. Okay, last uh, news release I'm going to talk about was out at Novo. And I, I am co-chairman here, uh, but one of the things we did, uh, we, we re-assayed a lot of the samples that we collected from drilling RC at Nunyeri last year. And we re-assayed them. We mul assayed multiple pots, 500-gram pots, 
using chrysos and it produced um, higher grade results. Why? Because there's coarse gold in the system. Okay, so by analyzing larger samples and then multiple pots of those samples and then averaging those numbers, uh, we get a uh, resultant, you know, increase of, of, of very significant increases in the, in the assays of some of these intervals. And these are pretty good intercepts, okay? So we are going to go back to Nangiri and drill some more holes. Uh, we're doing five, or sorry, 4,000 more meters of drilling because this has given us encouragement to say, hey, you know what, there might be a, a pretty decent shot at a resource. You know, why do I say that? Go to the next slide. You can see the strike length of Nangiri North. It is big. This is a big target. Basically, that belt, that green belt through there uh, is all perspective, even the, the areas down here to the to the left in the pink uh, intrusive rocks that is perspective and we've only drilled that one little cluster of drill holes there where you see the black polka dots okay this thing has a lot of runway and that kind of strike you know which is over a kilometer it's like almost two kilometers you could host a decent deposit so let's go to the next side and what are we seeing here those holes were shallow okay all of those holes that i just talked about the results they're quite shallow there are sea holes and, and they've defined uh, some high-grade, shallowly dipping high-grade uh, plunges to the system. This is the kind of thing where you could probably develop quite a bit of tonnage. Uh, you know, it'll be a, a structural zone, maybe a few meters wide, but over two kilometers long, yes, there is potential to host a lot of gold, like a million plus ounces with, with luck. Okay, so we are going to go back in there and try to retest this, all right? All right, that's it, guys. Um, apologize, went a little bit long, but it's what I had for this week. All right, thanks, Quentin. Um, so, um, look, everybody, gold is breaking out here. It's it's pretty darn exciting. The mining stocks, especially the explorers and the small cap and even micro cap explorers, the good ones that have the, the discoveries, I mean, they are so cheap relative to the price of gold. Um even the, the large cap miners are cheap relative to the price of gold. Tavi showed you the Newmont chart with that. It's the time to invest in mining stocks if ever there was a time. I know we've said this before. I've said this before. Uh, and we said the turn is coming. The turn is coming. And it's been, it's been uh, you know, we've, instead we you know, we've had a pullback for the last year. But now the turn really is coming. It's here. Mining stocks are up. This month significantly, the juniors, Crestcats portfolio, um, and gold is breaking out to a new time, new all-time high, and it looks like it's starting to run. Silver is breaking out. The mining stocks have so much to catch up. We believe our portfolio is deeply undervalued. It's time to um, it's time to put money to work. I really believe that. Um, and not just on the long side in the mining stocks, the whole great rotation theme that we have, uh, where we're expressing that in our long, short and global macro funds. This is also ripe to unfold uh, and you get the mining portfolio there, too. So if you're interested in what we're talking about, please give a call to Merrick. Send him an email. You know, reach out to us. Reach out to any of us. We're, we're here to, uh, to talk with you to find out about your situation and see where our strategies might be a good fit. Tavi, do you have any closing comments? Well, look, I think you said it very well. I mean, the timing is 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 always tricky, and and but certainly feels like with gold breaking out that we're in the beginning of something very special. But I'm very um, uh, proud of of where we are in terms of 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 a company and and this partners where in terms of the connections we've created in this industry. I mean, with working with Quentin. Um, you know the the capital we've actually already deployed and the position we're in to uh, to to kind of you know surf the wave of potentially being in a in a in a bull market for precious metals. I'm I'm very uh, you know I I think this is the time to be laser focused in this in this trend and uh, and certainly feels like this is the beginning of something very special and usually very secular uh, at its nature. So uh, nonetheless, well, happy Easter, everybody. We'll see each other next week. Uh, and uh, but thanks everyone for watching. Uh, and uh, we'll certainly be back on next Friday. Thanks, Quinton. Thanks, Kevin. Take care.